now. So it is December 3rd. This is the uh, fifth meeting of the UPSFF working group. Um, my name is Ryan Arori from the uh, Office of the State Superintendent of Education. I'm going to do a quick roll call to get us started. Let me just pull up the list. Um, Michael Bayek from DC Public Charter School Board. I'm here. Um, Vanessa Carlo Miranda from EL Haynes. Vanessa's not here yet. Ken Sherry from Friendship Public Charter School. And I'm also hearing an echo, so if you can all please mute yourselves when you're not talking. Uh, Chelsea Coffin from DC Policy Center. Here. Great. Um, Jen Comey from the Deputy Mayor for Education. Here. Great. Justin Ellis from KIPP DC Public Charter School. Here. Jeanette Fernandez from the Office of Budget and Performance Management. I am here. Great. Um, let me just see. So from DCPS, we have Shauna, I see you on. Um, can you just say if, who from DCPS is going to attend today? Shauna, you're on mute. I don't know if you're at your computer or not. Ryan, she just um, said that she's having trouble. Oh. Um, Mike, I think, but she said she's here. Okay, so we'll we'll pause on that and, and keep moving. Um, Shannon Hodge from the DC Charter School Alliance. I'm here. Great. And Kubila Huddleston from DC Fiscal Policy Institute. I don't see her on yet. Shelley Hughes from EdOps. Hi, I'm here. Great. Mary Levy. I don't see Mary on right now. Um, Jack McCarthy from Apple Tree Public Charter School. I'm here. Great. Alonzo Montavo from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. Great. Hey, Alonzo, can you just make sure you're muted when you're not talking? It's muted. I, I don't know. It's muted, but it's still on. Hold on. I'll, let me, I think I can mute you, so we'll just go with that. Um, Kathy Riley from DC Shape. I'm here. Thank you. Great. Um, Raymond Whedon from Thurgood Marshall Academy. Here. Hi, Raymond. And Jonathan Weinstein from Capital City Public Charter School. Here. Thank you. Great. Um, and it looks like Shauna, um, Shauna Wang from TCPS is having some audio issues and I don't see anyone else from TCPS on the call at the moment. Um, so as I said in um, the introductory email, Kevin is unable to attend today's meeting. Um, so I'll be leading the facilitation of the conversation. In Kevin's place, we have Carly Fishero from the Deputy Mayor for Education. So Carly, do you wanna just quickly introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, uh, Ryan. Appreciate it. I'm Carly Fishrow, Deputy Mayor uh, for Education's Chief of Staff, um, and I had the opportunity to um, work with Kevin during the when he was working with Afton. So I'm pretty familiar um, with all of the materials leading up to these working group sessions, and appreciate the just chance to listen and enjoy. Um, I am a fraction of Kevin, like a, a mm -hmm. mere fraction. So there may be a few questions that you uh, kick to Kevin or you would kick to Kevin's proxy, and that's me. Um, and if I can't answer them, I promise to get back to you shortly. So thanks. Yes, and we're since we're recording this, I'm sure Kevin will be able to watch watch later and and hear all of the comments that happen on today's meeting. Um, also, I want to make sure that we acknowledge Lindsay from the DME is also on, and she's um, helping to present and collect all of the information that we're going to talk about today. Um, so just real quick, some logistical things. Um, I'm handling the WebEx platform and facilitating at the same time. So if I miss a chat message or anything, please, please let me know. Um, so Ryan, Carla, uh, 
Vanessa can't is in not as a panelist, so that will inhibit her being able to contribute, won't it? I was able to fix it. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate your oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that for I, me, but I was able to fix it. For some reason, it was not letting me in as a panelist, but thank you, yeah. Kathy. Don't worry, I got that covered. Sometimes people join as attendees and then I change their role to panelist. So um, just another one of those things that I have to do to manage the, the WebEx platform. But glad you're here, Vanessa. Um, so reminder, please keep your cameras on and please keep yourself muted when you're not talking. Uh, there will also be a public comment period towards the end of the meeting where members of the public can provide comment. And um, so this meeting, we're going to be sharing some materials, but for the majority of the of the meeting, I think it's going to be more of a discussion. So I changed my layout to like the, the grid gallery view. You guys can do whatever you want, but I just think that that's really useful to see everybody's faces um, as we're having the discussions. And also, please feel free to use the chat for anything if you want to put a note in there. I just want to remind everyone that if you're sending a chat, make sure that it goes to everyone so that everyone can see it and not just me or Lindsay or the attendees. Just make sure it goes to everyone. Um, great. So as I said before, this is the fifth of our six UPSFF working group meetings. The last meeting will be held two weeks from today. Um, the first four meetings that we held were mainly to review the slide decks from the 2020 UPSFF study. Now we're going to be spending today um, discussing everything that we've talked about over the course of the meetings um, to uh, refine and hone the recommendations that will be included in the report. Um, so that means that there's going to be a lot, uh, a lot less of me or or Kevin um, talking to you and more of you talking to us with your feedback. Uh, judging from the emails that we've already received today, it sounds like you guys are ready and raring to go. So that's really exciting. Um, so we started sharing the recommendations at the end of last meeting. Um, that was the first draft. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is still a draft. It's not the final version. So your feedback is really important to help us to that final version. So the goal of today's meeting is to continue refining the recommendations, um, refining the ones that we've already written down on the, on the paper, and then also adding new recommendations that uh, we haven't yet had a chance to add into, into the recommendations list. Um, so we're gonna spend half the time talking about the current recommendations that we've already listed we're going to spend the second half of the time focusing on additional recommendations that the working group wants to include. Uh, but this is a totally fluid schedule. So depending on how the discussion goes, we can um, allocate more time where, wherever it's needed. And let's see what else I've got. Um, so based on the feedback of this meeting, we will adjust and add to the current draft of recommendations and share those with the group prior to our final discussion, which will be on December 17th. Uh, Lindsay, Kevin, and I did craft some questions to spur the discussion, but please, like, this is your your opportunity to speak up and make sure that your points are discussed. If uh, we don't specifically bring it up, we definitely want you guys to bring it up. Um, a lot of the questions that we had prepared for this meeting were also raised in the emails that were sent today, so that's really good. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge that this is usually the hardest part of the process where we are trying to come to agreements on what should be included in the recommendation list. Uh, this is a, diver a diverse group and everyone has different viewpoints, so please make sure your voice is heard. Uh, for some of us, this is our third time going through this process of creating a recommendations list, but others are brand new, so we just want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. And last general point before we actually dive in and talk about specific material. So what we're trying to do is capture the feedback of the working group, and that comes from us watching the recordings of these videos, reading what is in the chat, and also reading all of the emails that you have all sent to us um, so far. Um, I think generally the hardest part for us is that there's not always a full consensus of the recommendations. So what we're trying to do is capture that fact in the report. Um, this is indicated through various ways, like, for example, the temperature checks that we did shows that different people have different priorities. Um, 
So while this might come off as the report being more vague, um, that's just because we're trying to capture the fact that everyone has different viewpoints and is not all agreeing exactly on the same things. Um, but I just want to acknowledge also that we've ca captured a lot of information over the course of the past few meetings and your minds could have changed over that time. So continue to, to speak and share your feedback so that we can continue to capture that information. So what we're going to do now is move into the uh, draft recommendations that we've already uh, written and shared with you um, earlier this week. And I think what we want to do is just make sure that the way that these recommendations are written is meeting the viewpoints of the working group. Um, we uh, know that there's already going to be a lot of feedback on this. so. I think what the easiest thing for me to do is I've been capturing a lot of the points that were happening um, over email today to talk specifically about some of these recommendations. And I think it would be worthwhile to start with those points that were brought up. Um, but as I said, feel free to interrupt whenever you want so that you can um, share your viewpoints. Um, and so it's less of me talking and more of, of you guys talking. Um, so the first, the first uh, thing that we'll discuss is the first recommendation, um, which you can see um, we're sharing on on the screen now. And thank you for doing that, Lindsay. I'm just going to move some windows around so that it's easier for me to uh, read what we have on the screen. Uh, Ryan. Yes. Uh, this is Jack McCarthy. I think. It what I would recommend, I, I think this came through some of the email. It, it seems more intuitive in making recommendations that um, the first recommendation really ought to start with the foundation level versus starting with uh, the at risk. It just seems more logical to okay. start with the foundation and then move on. And it seemed there seemed to be some um, agreement with that among members, but I, I just like to test that and see what other people might think about that. Yeah, um, so I'll I'll open that up to the floor. I think in the past, the foundation level recommendation has usually been the top recommendation of this working group. Um, so yeah, let, let me pose Jack's question to you all. Um, if you want, we can start talking about the foundation level first. Um, so I want to know what you guys think about including a foundation level recommendation and if you want that to be first and then we can talk about what exactly that recommendation actually is. I, I think, you know, I'm glad this is a draft and I'm so glad that you shared it with us. That's a discussion we haven't even started yet about the foundation level. So I, I think it might be fine to go to that, but I. I do want to make sure we get to this because I think there's more consensus than is reflected in the document that you've written. Like our temperature checks came before we wrestled with it. Um, so I I would strongly advocate that our that we figure out where we have consensus and that we put that forward and that we not qualify it so much in the document. We might at you know at some point in your narrative talk about our process. And whether it's a strong majority or everyone, but I think to qualify everything as we write it will just make the people reading it saying, "Well, we don't really have to do anything." You know, it's just not strong enough that we that we have to move forward. So I, I would, I don't mind having the foundation level, and except I think that we do need to know if we are in favor of the ten percent. Like so, everything's going to be affected by by the amount of money that we're actually recommending. And we, we didn't look at any suggestions about the foundation level. Yeah, and let me yeah. just let me just pause and clarify that, Kathy, the 10% the that you're referring to is a number that was used throughout the um, UPSFF study for each of the options. Actually, maybe for all of the options, definitely most of the options 
uh, for example, it would be like a 10% increase to uh, X rate or a, a 10% increase to the EL weight. Um, that was a 10% number that was used in the study to act as a comparison for each of the options. Um, so um, that was not, a, the 10% was not something that was uh, come up with by this working group. It was come up with in the course of creating the UPSFF study. So I think that another point of discussion is the working group could recommend what they think that percent should be or that dollar amount should be um, as part of the recommendations so, if you want to. So the, the incremental increase that's noted, if we add it up, what our recommendations so far add in terms of the money, then if we did a, a foundation raise, that would add again to that? Just so we have some idea of how much money we're talking about, asking for. So I'm, can you can you just clarify your question? So so, well, the, so the report in the uh, in the in the uh, yes. study they used a ten percent number to to just use as as an example and to remain consistent among each of the options so that you could have a comparison for okay no, this option would be more expensive than than this option. Right, I do understand that. So as we start to discuss the foundation level, I'm just trying to understand how the 10% that we can see figure dollar figures for what it would add to ELL tiered or to overage high school students. Then if we just, as we discuss the, the foundation level, whether we start with, you know, what would it cost to just add inflation in or whatever, like what, what mm -hmm. are we gonna talk about when we talk about the foundation level? So I think what you're saying is if we, if there was a recommendation to increase the foundation level, then each of those other recommendations that were based on like a 10% increase to the weight right. could also be a different dollar amount than what's in right. the actual report. Yes. Right. Okay. Can you yeah, remind I, me, Ryan? This is Jen, just real quick. The, the UPSF study focused on foundation drivers, right? To yes. try to unearth sort of where there are higher costs and not, if I remember correctly. Yes, that is that is correct. Um, so while the study did not specifically look at the foundation level or make any recommendations to the to the to the actual foundation level, uh, I believe that this came as a result of the previous working group's report was that in order to make a judgment call or a recommendation about what the foundation level increase should be. Um, you wanted us to look at what the foundation cost drivers are for LEAs. And so the report does look at all of the different cost drivers that go into educating students um, to give you more information to make a recommendation about a foundation level. Right, and so with personnel, if there are fewer students, right? So I think lower utilization of facilities is just fewer students in some buildings. And then the cost of financing and maintaining, those are the three punch lines from the study. Okay. So as I think if we're going to talk about just to ground in something, uh, fact is helpful. Yeah, I agree with, with Jen on that. Um, I was curious if the group had any thoughts on, on trying to tie a recommendation either to the, the teacher salary, cumulative, cumulative annual growth rate, or the total per pupil expenditure per pupil growth rate, both which are noted in the study, somewhere around four to four and a half percent. Um, I just thought that might be a starting point for discussion. Um, now, in addition to that, we're we're in a kind of classic recessionary. Uh, education environment where we're going to have increased teacher retention and additional costs related to the pandemic, um, which I, I think that we, we should make note of at some point in the study as well, um, specifically for funding for next year. I can get behind that approach. I think um, personnel costs is obviously the biggest driver 
for most of us. So I think looking at personnel cost increases um, certainly makes sense, would capture the majority of our costs, although it wouldn't capture all of the costs, um, but it should capture anywhere between 70 and 80% in some cases uh, of a school's cost. Um, I, I think uh, I think that the as I have always understood the the spirit and goal of this working group is to make a recommendation of what we believe it takes to fund schools to be able to deliver on the mass on the mission. Um, I, I understand that there's always financial realities and we need to be thoughtful and careful about those. Um, but ultimately, um, it you know somebody else will have to make that decision about which which recommendations they will fund and which recommendations they will have to. Uh, not be able to fund this year because of a, of a, of a potential budget situation. Um, I don't know if there's consensus around that in the group, um, but I think that when, once we start making those decisions ourselves about what should be in or out because of potential budgetary concerns, it feels like we might be shooting ourselves a little bit in the foot um, if we're supposed to be putting together what we think it's, it's actually going to take um, even if it doesn't get funded in this fiscal year, it could get funded in future fiscal years once the district is in a better financial position. Um, and so I just, I think it's important that we put what we think needs to be in it without cutting ourselves short. But, but I would still prioritize the the ELL and the um, at-risk weight is, is important. I mean, I think that's what we'll have to come to. What do we think is the most important? Um, so, we'll, I mean, I think we should ask for what we want to ask for, but I, I do want to prioritize what is most important. So I'm not sure where at this point we start, you know, with the personnel costs because some schools some LEAs have far more resources than other LEAs. It's it's really all over the map. But I thought before we had looked at inflation and then different different justifications for what we were doing. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, we we want to capture um, a recommendation related to the foundation level that that you guys want to propose. Um, and then also be able to to capture the reasoning behind what that foundation level is. So if it is related to the cost drivers that are in the report, or if it's related to inflation, we want you all to tell us that. So is anybody um, in disagreement or have any other thoughts about what should what should be included in a recommendation? I'm just curious to hear other people's thoughts on Kathy's suggestion that there's priority over others. Like, is that where, we, where this group is comfortable or at least some really? I mean, I think it's, I think consensus is sometimes hard, um, but that is an interesting question, Kathy. Uh, to well, that's why I sort of feel like given the, the climate that we're in, I don't want to lose the opportunity to get the at risk and raise an at risk and a raise an ELL because it looks like the foundation is our be all and end all because I, I think the targeted, I, I feel like I, I want to make sure we get the, a targeted effect for these populations that have actually seen the greatest hit during this time. So, um, and that would, that would affect those students across both sectors that are most most hurt. So I, I, I don't know what we're going to do with the UPSFF. That's something the mayor usually has a decision about. So I don't want to put all our eggs in that basket. Um, that's my feeling. Um, this is Jack. I, I, um, I think your, your points are persuasive, Kathy, but one of the things that, that stuck with me from our, at the time we spent on those issues, uh, was the the amount of time that we also spent in talking about how the particularly in the case of um, ELL students and and also in the case of the at risk, where even though the desire was for those dollars to be targeted, there seemed to be some frustration 
that we weren't actually hitting those targets. Um, that you know, if if that we were um, we were educating a lot of people who were not really qualifying in the data, maybe not using the right words, but there seemed to be um, almost an intuitive sense that the funds could be targeted if if they could be more precisely, but we're, we're just not at that point where where we actually can bring those funds together with the greatest need through the LEAs that we have um, with the precision that we would like. And so that's why, to me, um, especially given all the uncertainty in the economy um, with the pandemic and the other challenges that we have, um, it, it seems more plausible to focus on um, on the foundation to at least ensure that there are um, there are the resources there to you know sort of work with more broadly, and that's just my thought. So I, I think what I'm what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in the chat is that most people agree that there should be a recommendation related to the foundation level. Um, we don't quite know what exactly that recommendation is going to be yet. There's been some ideas that have been um, brought up by members of the working group. Um, but that a separate question is how that foundation level recommendation gets um, uh, tiered in relation to the other, like the at risk and the and the EL definitions. So. Do we want to try to spend a little bit more time honing in on what that foundation level recommendation looks like, or do we want to move on to um, other areas? What, what would what would what would at least hold us constant? Like take into account the different different expenses that have gone up. Like what raise in the foundation level would at least let people start not behind. You know, there's certain things that. Um, that everybody has to incorporate. So we could defend that. Uh, this is Alonso. Uh, historically speaking, if you look at the foundation level per pupil, in reality, the mayor has provided that at least 2% increases over the several years. Uh, I thought that when we were talking about the two populations, the idea will be to, this is my idea, just to quantify the recommendations to increase the weights. That way, the, those two specific populations will be more benefited. Hi, this is Jeanette. I tend to agree with that point, Alonzo, and generally with the point that Kathy is making about prioritizing um, specific weights within the within the UPSFF over the foundation level. I think it's fair to say we want to make a recommendation on the foundation, um, but I also think that prioritizing those weights for at risk and L is also more reflective of how we spent our time as a working group, because um, that is what we focused on. And I, I, I think that Lonzo is making a nuanced point about the fact that the foundation will likely increase anyways. It might not increase to the to the magnitude that we would like, but by being more surgical in our recommendation on a specific weight, we can probably maximize the political capital that this report brings. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. Um, I, I think I agree with what Jeanette just said. I mean, one thing I think, though, we could do with regards to the, the base is just say that, you know, the increase should be reflective of like real cost. I think Historically, that has not been the case. I mean, in fiscal year 2018, I want to say the Committee on Education in their committee report analyzed several years of increases and found that it 
the mayor's increases didn't consistently track inflation or student enrollment growth. And so I think at a minimum, like if we want to have something to say without pigeonholing ourselves into saying a specific increase uh, percent, uh, we can just say, you know, it should be based off of actual costs because that's going to vary each year. Like fiscal year 20, the increase was less than teacher salary growth, at least in DCPS. But this past year, that wasn't the case, but that's going to fluctuate. Um, so I don't know. I think trying to encourage the mayor to base it off of real cost is a sound thing to do, but I'm open to push back. I just want to make sure there's a lot of chat um, that is being shared, and I just want to make sure that it's being captured as well um, from both Shannon and Jonathan and Raymond. Okay, and I'll just read that so that it's uh, for anybody that just wants to watch the video. So Shannon had said, I think it's important to request an increase in the foundation and stress the importance of targeted increased funding for special populations. Um, and then Vanessa, you had said um, generally there's a 3% increase, but teacher salaries grow by 4%. Uh, Raymond is agreeing with Shannon's point. And Jonathan says, I think we have discussed and agreed that the incremental increases in targeted population spending are not enough to make tangible differences in hiring or other supports. As such, an increase in the foundational level of funding is likely to have a larger funding impact for each school than surgical increases and therefore result in a greater benefit to serving student needs. If I can just say something about the last point, I, I agree with Jonathan, except for the schools that have high concentrations of the students for whom we are considering directing additional funding. So I can tell you that the school where I was a leader, um, an increase in at-risk funding could for me be an additional teacher. It could be an additional support staff, an additional program, because we had such a high percentage of students designated as at-risk. Um, if you were on the lower end of, for any of the special populations that we're talking about, I agree, but I don't wanna leave out those schools for whom we are asking a lot for a significant portion of their student population. Um, and, and to me, if we, you know, I think one way that we can signal that is to indicate that it is important to still direct funding to those targeted special populations. I understand we ended up not kind of going in the direction or the consensus wasn't in the direction of kind of by concentration, uh, but you do have some LEAs that are 80, 90% um, at risk or whatever other population and that funding does make a difference. That incremental funding does make a difference. I mean, that's helpful, Shannon. I think that's actually why this working group was focused on the at-risk and L, precisely because it was following up on the last working group that also wanted to highlight those points. So I appreciate you reiterating that. I, I <laughs> just want to say I, I agree with your point, Shannon, uh, completely, and, and the impact on higher concentration schools is clear. But I, I following up on Jen's comment just now, it's important that we highlight that while also recognizing that that is a small percentage of the overall student population and, and LEA representation. And while this group is focusing on these targeted populations and, and it, it is appropriate to draw attention to that and to direct resources there, the bang for the buck, the greater impact on school resources to serve students across all LEAs um, is still going to be felt through an increase in the foundation level funding. So enhancing that for schools with greater concentrations makes sense, but as a priority goal of this working committee, even if we're looking to serve those special populations, I think we accomplish that more broadly by increasing the foundation level than through the targeted efforts across all LEAs. I, I may be overstating it, so please correct yeah. me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree to an extent. My concern is that we're, there are other gaps that we're also talking about. So if, if we give everyone more money, we're just going to raise the lower level and, and keep the gaps where they are. If we actually want to close gaps, we will have to target funding in specific places. And so I just want to make sure that we're not losing sight of that, which by, I, I absolutely believe that we should be talking about increasing the funding, the foundation level. But we also, if we are serious about 
recommending funding that will help close gaps that are persistent in this city, we have to be willing to make the tough call to direct resources in places where we have not been willing to direct them before. Okay, I, I'm going to... Oh. Well, can I, can I say something really yep. quickly? Go, go ahead. I, I just want to say, I mean, and, you know, our group, I guess, is not tasked with solving this issue, but we still can't ignore the fact that in DCPS, we have supplanting going on. So when we talk about targeting of funds, I don't know that that's, like we can increase the at-risk funding, but if we still have an issue of like, there not being enough base funding and DCP is still filling the need to supplant, I feel like our, our sort of goal is undermined by that. And I don't know how we get a, I don't know how we, if we comment on that or what, but I, I feel like that can't be something that we do not pay attention to. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put a, a pin in that one because I do want to make sure that we get through. We have a lot of questions about like the at risk and the EL recommendations that we that we have that I want to make sure that we get to. Um, so I'm gonna put a pin in that. We're also gonna put a pin in the um, foundation level. Um, I think we have a lot of feedback from the working group that we're gonna have to parse through um, to create a recommendation that will that we'll be able to share with you guys for the next meeting. Um, and then we'll also be able to talk a little bit more about how we want to tier foundation versus uh, the other recommendations. But let's let's move back to the recommendations that we've already drafted and make sure that those are um, at a level that the working group is comfortable with. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with some of the comments that were we were talking about that that were raised over email earlier today to make sure that uh, the entire working group can respond to those. Um, so, first off, uh, in the email that Kathy had sent, she said, um, I do not think we ever discussed a timeline of 4 years in terms of implementation. Um, so, what we had heard from the working group in previous meetings was that there should be a timeline to be more specific um, with these recommendations. We had not heard a specific timeline from the working group, though. So what we did was we put in a placeholder of four years because that was a timeline that had been used in previous reports. So uh, whether or not we want to change that, um, totally open to uh, whatever the working group um, has to say about that. So um, let's just start there. So in terms of timeline, um, what what are you thinking? as soon as feasible. I mean, we're, yeah, we're not I, controlling the, the dollars, so uh, I, I think as soon as feasible may be the best we can hope for. Yeah, my concern is if we said four years, they'd say, oh, great, we don't have to do it for four years. So I, I would be um, interested in hearing other people's thoughts. I, I missed that somehow in the previous one because I, I think our hope is that it would be enacted for FY21, but that may not be possible, but that's certainly our, our wish. And I think to both of those points, is there a way to, to link the urgency to the fact that like the original report, whatever, whenever that was written 13, 14, I also said like by a certain time and, and it wasn't met. Like, and so like, is there a way to say as a result of it not being met, the urgency is that much higher than whatever, you know, right? I think there also may be a way to tie the um, the timeline, right? Maybe we we want to be more general with our language, which is not like to define a specific year by which this happens, but instead focus on the urgency with which it needs to happen. But by connecting the timeline with the prioritization, Kathy, that you talked about, right? Like as we think about, you know, it's most critical that we um, prioritize, for example, let's say the the at risk or the overage weight. Um, and that that is that we work systematically to um, put our prioritized needs um, into um, into the um, into action as quickly as possible, um, and understand that the other ones would come subsequently. But so thinking of it as sort of like a, a phase roll in, right, with some starting earlier than others. 
I, I also, I like that idea and I also uh, can't help but think about how an executive branch might actually implement these recommendations. And I like the idea that Raymond sort of mentioned, although not as a retrospective thing, as a looking forward thing, to be able to say that if these aren't really met after a certain number of years, they become less useful, right? Because costs and inflation have changed. Um, and we can point to, you know, retrospectively what a previous report, you know, was or wasn't met. Um, but I think it's helpful to do that looking forward as well. I, I'm not sure what level of academic exercise that might entail, but I think it would be useful to say something to that effect of like, we want these things as soon as feasible, but we recognize there's, you know, impediments to that. However, you know, after a certain number of years, X number of years, they be, these recommendations become, you know, less and less um, accurate, so to speak. I agree with that comment. I would take it one step further, right? Like we have had a number of studies that have shown us that we needed to fund certain populations, certain targets to certain levels, and we still haven't been able to achieve those targets. And those studies are already, you know, several years so I think to me, I would I would make that point, but with a little bit more urgency to it, uh, because we keep making these recommendations and they keep not being met, um, which is why I do agree with Kathy that we need to be a little bit more aggressive and not just leave it open ended. I think we do need to put some kind of timeline um, that it's not vague, because if I know anything about this government is if you believe gave vagueness, that means, you know, that's my way out. There's no real um, weight behind this. So if we're going to put together a report and a recommendation, it should say and mention that there's a history here of multiple recommendations that have been that have yet to be met. Um, going back to not just the adequacy study, but I, I recall even before the adequacy story study, um, we, you know, those are old recommendations and we're nowhere near meeting them. Specifically, I'm thinking about the EL recommendation where there was a, a very specific number. My, my other point that I'd like to make is we, we seem to be talking about these resources as if they were a one-on-one -on -one correlation monetarily. And I don't, I could be wrong. Um, I know some of you have, have been working with this data at a, at a more detailed level. So my wondering is, you know, the investment, if we're thinking about it from a dollar's amount into the recommendations for at-risk and EL must be way lower than any investments to the foundation um, from a dollar amount. Um, and so to me, there's something to be said about you know, we we should be able to advocate for both, um, and 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 maybe the conversation for this group in order to craft that recommendation is to what extent we're saying, you know, in an ideal world we want X, uh, understanding that that may not be doable in year one, uh, we may want to you know phase it into two years, whereas year one we recommend X, year two we recommend Y. I think that the more specific we can get with both the recommendation and the timeline. The more likely that this report will take will will have some weight behind it and will be taken seriously. I think just one more quick point on the timeline when you're thinking about which to put in different years is thinking about weights that can be implemented right now and others like the SLIFE or the WIDA through for EL that may need an extra year to get the data and the systems and you know agreement on common definitions. You can go to the traffic light chart um, if you're looking for. Uh, I don't know, something to base the timeline on. The one caveat I would say um, in response to the comments that I heard from Vanessa was, is that I, I do think, um, you know, asking for things within a specific time frame is certainly a good, a good idea. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that I don't think then we can ask for, or, or maybe we can, and I'm you know, just limited in my perspective, but I, I think if we want to set realistic timelines, then we also have to ask for realistic um, increases. Um, and I would just say that, you know, I would caution against us saying, let's ask for everything we want, um, although I know that there's a there's a strong 
rationale behind asking for what we think it should be or, or what we think the um, is appropriate, you know, regarding costs. Um, I just think that if, if, if we are going to be really prescriptive about the time to achieve these things, um, then we also need to be, um, you know, kind of, uh, we also need to be responsive to the, the economic contraction that we're currently in. Yeah, I, I feel like it, it would be, and we've talked about this before, tone deaf to not mention sort of the situation that we're in. So I realize it has, that has uh, different priorities and different impacts, but it does seem to me, it, it, it would it would make sense and presumably have more weight with that other mention. I, I think uh, saying, asking for or recommending the changes that we think will most benefit students and the schools that are serving them, we have to make those recommendations with whatever, and we can acknowledge that it's a tight financial environment and the choices will be difficult across many areas, but I don't think that means we cut or lessen what we say is needed. Um, and I, so I, I'd wanna balance that. U ultimately, the burden for making those choices isn't ours, um, it's somebody else's. And we need to give them as much information to make those choices as possible and not hold back in terms of what we think is necessary. Um, to go back to what Shannon and Chelsea said, you know, would and Jen, would we look at what the implementation period is? You know, I mean, I think being very specific, you know, this group meets again in two years. That's that's our time frame. You know, we're kind of making these recommendations for the next two years and then the UPSFF group meets again and makes new recommendations. So in that way, without saying this is a two year timeline, it's just like, you know, our recommendation is that these be implemented this year and that they're what we need, but they're also reasonable. Because, you know, I, I agree with you, Jonathan, but I also feel I don't want to be thrown out. I, I want it to be like, this makes sense. This is, you know, this is a tremendous time that students have taken a huge hit in their education. We have to fund this. And along with transportation and housing and the other things that will affect our students. But if we use that two years uh, to what Chelsea said, and some of the things need an extra year to be implemented, but definitely they would have to be implemented in FY22. That's it. That seems reasonable to me. I mean, we're not making, we're only making recommendations in three different categories, you know, at risk, ELL, and the foundation. So I think we can, I think we can do that. Does anybody disagree? If we put um, like a two year uh, time frame attached to the recommendations? I, I don't I don't disagree, and I think it's important for us to realize like we definitely won't get anything we don't recommend. Uh, and so, even in, in this most recent budget cycle, I think people assume that all the education funding uh, would be cut, and that wasn't the case at all. There was still a small increase. Uh, so, I think to everyone's point that has spoken recently, like there is a way to respectfully um, indicate the importance of this to provide a realistic timeline and to do it in a way that isn't tone deaf, but that doesn't sell ourselves short. Uh, because we certainly won't get it if we don't recommend it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Shannon on that point. Um, thinking back to the last study, um, which was going into the 2017 school year, I believe, that was a year when there was a lot of uncertainty around funding, when there was um, thoughts that it would be at 0%. And I know that there was a, a, a lot of advocacy efforts that pointed to this working group study that said that we needed 3.5%. Um, that was that was helpful in getting council to increase the per people weight. But I think it would be beneficial for all of us to have something to point to in the event that you know the mayor signals a, a negative increase or you know flat funding that we can use this for advocacy, advocacy purposes as well. It's been effective in the past. Okay, um, I want to make sure that we talk about the other recommendations. So is there any um, additional comments that anybody wants to make about this first recommendation that, that is on the screen now? I think one other 
recommendation I'd like to make. Oh no, maybe this is the second. Never mind. I'll wait. <laughs> okay, so um, Lindsay, can you scroll down to the second recommendation? Um, okay, so the second recommendation um, talks about the existing at risk definition and I, there was some uh, email comments about this too, um, specifically about 2A. I think maybe Vanessa had brought up something about 2A. Um, so I wanna open the floor on that. I think um, we've heard a lot about making changes to the at-risk definition. We haven't heard a lot about specific, like what specific changes should be made. So I want to make sure that the working group speaks up on that as well. I can start with, so my comment had to do more with just the, the negativity around the 2A. It, it, it almost negates that what the intent that I heard from everybody, which is that this has to be looked at carefully. And it, it just starts with, it can't be done. <laughs> um, and so my wondering is how can we reframe it where it acknowledges the limitations, but it does it in a way that doesn't take away the intent of the group. Mm -hmm. So I think we can we can reword we can look into rewording this based on based on that feedback. Kathy, I think you're trying to talk. Oh yeah, Kathy, you're on mute. Uh, I think we want to be clear that we're not taking anybody off. We're not looking at reconsidering it and subtracting someone. Uh, the, so it, it to include students who are not who are currently not counted. I just want it to be clear. We're looking at okay. adding, but not subtracting. Yeah, that yeah. was not our intent. So we can, if that was, if that's how you're reading it, then we can make. make no, no. I just want to make. I think it's in there, but I think it should be very explicit. Mm -hmm. I think we should also add a recommendation that the city think about a different word for at-risk funding. Oh, yes. Yes. We all know, and as everyone has said, and I, I would I would love to use this space to recommend that. I don't have a strong recommendation, but I think it's really important. There are two things I want to bring up in this section, and I and I apologize if it's if it's later, and so just tell me that now. But I know one piece that we have talked about multiple times in multiple places is about undocumented uh, students and those who um, don't necessarily participate in some of the um, programs here that are listed for the definition of students who are behind academically. Um, so I don't know, again, I don't think we have a great solution, but I do think it is worth mentioning that as another area for exploration for the future. That's one. And two, um, to Jonathan's point, there's a point, there's a, he put a point in the chat about 2B, about adding a specific recommendation that students who qualify for FARM uh, would qualify for or at risk. I really, I'm very much uh, concerned about using FARM because of the community eligibility provision. Um, at that point, it would get us up to 80, 85, 90%, whether I'm not exaggerating a bit, but right, it gets it up really high. And at that point, we're actually not getting targeted with our community. It's just more foundation level. And I think the goal really is to be more targeted here with that weight. So just Jonathan, sorry, I just want to call that out while I am forth. Jonathan, is there any way you could be more specific about those students? Because farm has become almost meaningless. Like, I think there has, I wonder if there's some way to be more specific. I don't know if Jonathan's muted, I can't see him. Sorry about that. Um, we have students whose families qualify at an income level for SNAP or TANF. But due to their documentation status or concerns over applying for that, do not receive SNAP or are not eligible for SNAP or TANF benefits. So if through an application process that is validated and verified and checked, uh, students demonstrate that they are at income levels that would qualify for those programs, they should be eligible. We collect applications. We're, we're not community-based. 
And I'm curious whether opening this so that, and I'm not sure what the collection process would be, but for schools that already have a community-based um, information or, or a community-based access to free and reduced meals, if there were an additional application process for individual students that would qualify them, then using that status at other schools and those applications at other schools might be helpful. And maybe it's just free, maybe it's not reduced, although, again, seeing the levels at which, the income levels at which folks qualify for either free or reduced is really demonstrates an at-risk or opportunity uh, situation that should be addressed. So that's your way of giving it undocumented students, which is ironic because that's what I brought up to begin with. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe it's also WIC or other uh, benefits that we know that some populations participate more in than others. I feel like I don't know enough uh, to, to make a strong recommendation, but I hear you on that intent, uh, Jonathan. I do. I, I still hesitate about uh, foreign and how that would work necessarily, but um, I, I'm in agreement with you that it needs more exploration. That's for sure. So. Uh, would it be accurate then to say that the working group doesn't have specific recommendations for how to change the at risk definition, but that we should explore ways to include um, groups of students like undocumented students or students that are that qualify for SNAP and TANF, but are not um, actually receiving SNAP and TANF? I, th I, th I just want to start with the negative, Ryan. I just think it's say the working group recommends uh, changing this, and these are some suggestions. That if we say we don't have specific suggestions, and then we follow with some actually specific suggestions that aren't all inclusive, I think it dilutes our our thought. Okay. This is Alonso. Do we know the extent of this population that has been excluded from the count? I mean, I know some LEAs have, it's it's obviously different for, for each LEA. Some LEAs are more impacted by this than others. And I think that um, some folks on this, on this working group have, have shared some of that information. It's just one point of reference, Alonzo, but we have 43% at risk students in our high school, but 63 to 67% uh, free and reduced meals qualified students. So 20% in your case is out. And then, do you know if this is now getting in the weeds, Jonathan? Do you know if they're free or they're reduced? I forget the crosswalk between SNAP and reduced. Reduced is still a higher income level, correct? Yes, reduced is a, a higher income level. I will, I can get the information on how many are each. Just that's part of the whole. I would say that I, I think 580 out of 650 students are free and the rest are reduced, but that's off the top of my head. Okay, um, let's move down to three and four. Lindsay, if you can just scroll down and see me. Hey, Ryan, um, I just want to, I just want to, I'm sorry, I know time is of an issue. Can we just make sure that we're, that we're just, right? Uh, I'm sympathetic that the report needs to be drafted with the next iteration and we want to make sure that we're clear on what we're putting in there. And I wasn't contributing to that clarity, so I apologize. Um, so where are we falling as a group? It sounds like there is some concern about we are too negative about data limitations, but at the same time, we need to recognize that there are some data limitations. I think to take it out is no one is suggesting that. So there's some sort of rephrasing along that point. There is a point of under B including parenting children incarcerated and then jonathan do you want to be explicit about 
the farm or is it more about students who don't participate typically in the SNAP TAM, uh, you know, um, benefits? I think farm could is a possible way to access that. Um, I just included in the chat our numbers um, on the latest report. Um, it, it's it's a means mm -hmm. to access kids who are at income levels that would qualify for SNAP or TANF, but are not engaged in or enrolled in those programs. It may because, not be the best way, but it is a way. Because they're not enrolled because they're, they're afraid to enroll because they're undocumented. I'm not, I, I, we have anecdotal evidence. I can't say it's across the board for all 300 students in that circumstance. But so they do fill out the, they fill out the farm survey, just not any other survey. Correct, correct. We have families that apply for free or reduced meals that are not enrolled in those other programs. And the reasons they're not enrolled may be broad, but we do know that a significant portion of them are uh, related to immigration status or documentation status or concerns over extended family relationships in that regard and enrolling in public programs. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there usually is a gap between the at-risk number and the farms number. So we certainly fall in that category too where our, our farms numbers are higher than an at-risk number. So there is definitely a gap there. Um, but I don't know that we can articulate all the reasons why. I think we certainly saw, a, so there's this magical September 30th date that happens for the benefits of many of the families. And if they don't get enrolled into those benefits by, by September 30th, they get dropped and therefore they don't direct certified by Aussie for purposes of at-risk counts. Um, so what we have done is we have compared who was in the list for direct cert by, on September 30th, and then how that list drastically changed on October 1st. And when you look at those families that could have potentially qualified for SNAP or other programs, uh, many of them tend to have uh, last names that could signal what Jonathan is, is referring to. Um, we definitely saw that happen two years ago. Um, or three years ago, and, and we still have a gap between our farms number and our address number. Uh, so I think it'd be interesting to look at it from that perspective is if you're not a community eligible school, is there a consistent gap there across LEAs? You're on mute, Jen. I just want to go back to again, this is trying to address a situation where uh, families aren't participating in these federal programs, right? So I think that's what we need. That's what I'm suggesting that we make clear. The uh, you know farm redu you know reduced or free may be one solution. It's possible there may be some others. So that would be my suggestion to put in the recommendation. Is that's what we are identifying as a challenge, and then you know we can name a few options that need to be explored. How does that sound for folks? I see heads nodding and thumbs up. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I'll take, I can only see like four of you at a time, but I'll take that <laughs> sample. All right. Thank you, Jen. Um, so let's keep moving. Uh, I want to make sure we get to uh, the next recommendation. So, three, so let's go through one by one. Um, I, I don't think that there's a lot of pushback on three, but I just want to open that up. Um, three is essentially making sure that the alternative weight is tied to the high school and the at-risk weights. Um, that's originally how it's been calculated, but then um, in the past, uh, when the at-risk weight changes, the alternative weight doesn't automatically change. So this is what, what that uh, recommendation addresses. I think that's problem? unanimous. I don't think you have to say yeah. several. I think okay. that's unanimous. Okay. <laughs> is, so, am I right? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Number four. Um, let's see. Number four is about the um, becoming over be, addressing the issue of um, overage students, but addressing it before they get to high school. 
and there, there wasn't any email chatter about this one, but I just want to again open it up to see if there's any um, revisions or anything that we want to make to number four. Brian, is there actually just saying that the next working group should study this or what, what what it doesn't have any money attached to it? It's just saying this should be looked at. Like, I would think this should be in a separate category from our. Our main recommendations that will impact the UPSFF actual oh. funding. I think there should be recommendations of things we want studied, and I think the at risk definition would fall into that also. That it it's not it's not going to be in this budget cycle because we want them to really see what we. So I would just put it in a separate category. Is is that right? We're just basically saying this has to be studied. Yes, I yeah. think that I think that this was something that the working group uh, all was generally in agreement on, but we we uh, didn't have enough information to be able to make a specific uh, monetary recommendation regarding this group of students. Um, so does anybody disagree with what Kathy just proposed about just keeping it as a recommendation, but just reorganizing it a little bit to include it into like the more into a, into a more like exploratory thing instead of attaching money to it. Seeing in in the five boxes, I can see I see a little bit of nods. Right, and so in this case, it's just a uh, this is I guess when you're saying about putting another category, Kathy, you're talking about just another top like for further study. There's like a further study section, right? right. That's all I'm saying. You know, when you say it's right there, front and center. Front and center. Yep. Sounds great. I, I thumbs up. Me. Great. Um, okay, so now let's move on to recommendation number five, which deals with at risk concentration. So, if, Lindsay, if you could just scroll down a teeny bit so that we can get the entire recommendation on. Um, yeah, so again, we've, we've talked a lot about at risk concentration. Uh, We've had, uh, you know, the temperature checks and everything to see which which categories of uh, which options of at-risk concentration uh, folks were more in agreement with, and I think that this one was, while not maybe like unanimous, was was very much clear that uh, folks were looking more at the community eligibility or the scaling options so that we could avoid any funding cliffs related to at-risk concentration, and I think that that that's what we tried to capture here. Um, so, is there any um, any discussion related to the fifth recommendation here? I have one. This is I'm just going to throw this out as my position. I am very uncomfortable. I like. I understand why we focused on this, and I get that um, schools that have concentrations have higher needs. I am very uncomfortable in the EPSFF having a school level type weight. Uh, I just feel like it, it, it's it's just so counter to how this is all set up. So. I agree with the first part of five, and then we proceed to go into options. Like to me, like I that just makes me slightly uncomfortable because I would rather the narrative be. We looked at it. There are maybe there's a section of there's, and I don't want. I don't know where we stand, frankly, with the whole group. But I am a little uncomfortable about putting out options that then somebody could grab and say, "Let's do this," because they recommended it when we actually didn't. So that's that's me. I, I I was surprised. I didn't think we made this. I thought we decided that the um, that number one would hit most of the students, and we we kind of shied away from doing the community one at this point. So I I was a little bit surprised to see this. So I'd be as an actual recommendation, and in a way we say we kind of want to do one. It, it's not clear to me what we're saying. That we're saying we go with our number one. We want to do overage and to factor, but then we say, if we're going to do this, then we would do this and not this. So I it, I thought we actually didn't reach consensus on this one. That was my impression. Even though I think it's a problem, I thought we decided that if, if you had all those students, especially if we're able to address the definition of at risk, um, then we might have hit this. Anyway, I'd be curious if other people thought we came to this conclusion. 
Well, I like to me, what you just described is how we sort of wrote it down, where we definitely preferred at risk need over at risk concentration because at risk concentration is so complex and because it's a school level characteristic instead of a student level characteristic. Um, can I make a suggestion? Then? The choice then? Are we saying it's up to you what you want? We prefer this, but then what do you want? I would put it in narrative and appendix, put it in the body. If this was part of the discussion, I just don't know if I would put it in the recommendation. That's my vote. Because I hear you, you want to capture all where things fell and what we were talking about. We spent, I don't know how many meetings on it. Uh, and we you know, spent a third of our study on it. Uh, but I'm not sure if it falls into a recommendation section. Does anybody disagree? Okay, we're going to take that as consensus then. Um, let's get down to recommendation six, um, where we're talking about EL funding. And uh, I want to make sure we spend enough time on this because there was a lot of feedback about EL funding and uh, these recommendations specifically. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot on the page, so sorry if it's if it's too small. Um, so let me let me open it up to to the group. I think uh, we wanted to make sure that we got SLIFE and new to country in here, and we wanted to acknowledge that that is a small subset of EL students. And we also wanted to make sure that we captured the idea of EL of of tiering EL funding based on. I want to make sure I get it right. I, it was either grade level or I want to say grade level. Um, but then there is also the uh, part that I don't think we addressed, which was the adequacy study EL weight um, and making sure that we acknowledge that. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and just let anybody chime in on any of those points. Yeah, I mean, I think that what what I would hope but I'm curious to hear what others would have to say is if our point of departure or the EL is to go back to the adequacy study and say, you know, for years now, the District of Columbia has not adequately uh, funded EL period, right? That that's just a statement on its own. Um, and, and, and do, you know, if we need to benchmark it to a number, we have a number from the adequacy study that would provide an increase to EL. Um, and then, in addition to that, we recognize that there is this unique population within EL, um, which I think, if, if memory serves me well, we're saying we need to do further research, right? Is this kind of falls under that category that we were talking earlier that needs a little bit more definition and, and data? I think uh, in terms of SLIFE and new to country, there's not a consistent definition. Um, so, so that would need to be created and, and, um, oh, sorry, Lindsay, I can see your, uh, your word document. <laughs> Is this the same recommendations? Oh, I see what you did. You, you've made it easier to, to read. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm curious to hear from others where they think about that. I thought we were going to clearly say that we wanted to recommend an increase in the ELL, uh, the tiered funding by, you know, three K through five and six through 12, but this doesn't read that way. So I, I, I thought that was our recommendation. And then, you know, similar to what we did with that risk that we do recommend an increase for SLIFE and new to country, um, that those two are, those two were our recommendations. I thought we weren't, finished on figuring what the grade configuration was if we went with six through 12 or you know k through eight and nine through 12 but that we understand we have to recommend a raise to the el weight so i i i don't think it reads that way i thought it was kind of straightforward that we, what we described what we decided but it did other people see the way it's listed in a and b it, it it's uh, it seems qualified not we recommend an increase in this weight for these reasons. 
yeah, it's not it, it to be clear, it's not in there. And the feedback that I've heard is that we do need to include that into the recommendation. Again, unless anybody disagrees. And so we are going to essentially uh, maybe move A and B down to B and C and put in an, an A um, that says uh, the, the working group recommends increasing the EL weight to the adequacy study level. Well, I would put it in six, like at the top of six. Okay. okay. Uh, you're right. That and then if sense. we need to make seven, life and um new to country then we make that seven but we are we cut out some other ones so we're like back to four or something okay so one thing that we haven't had a chance to talk a lot about as a group but that has been talked about with different members of this group um is that uh there because there there's this thing that keeps we come keep coming back to which is how do we support Recent immigrants into the that are that are to see residents, um, or and that could be either legally or undocumented, right? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the current sort of purpose and, and and population that's being served by the Welcome Center that DC runs, DCPS, I should say. Um, and so my wondering is if there would be an appetite to include as part of this recommendation that we expand the services to the Welcome Center um, so that it doesn't just serve DC PS students, but that it's all DC residents. Um, and, and, and I want to be clear because if, if Elba would be here, she would say this, so I want to honor her uh, work, uh, which is that they don't turn students away. I'm not suggesting that they would turn a student away because they don't attend DC PS. They actually do an amazing job of serving all students However, it is clearly a DCPS program. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the, every charter school ends up having to duplicate similar efforts. Um, and to give you a concrete example, it would be, you know, the, the translation of, of transcripts uh, of a high school student, for example. Um, and so uh, wanted to see if there was a, 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 if we could add a simple recommendation that we expand the current services of the Welcome Center to serve all students, whether they attend DCPS and charter schools, which would require more resources, uh, but it would be a way to further service, not just ELL families, but it could also get to the undocumented and recent immigrants that we've been struggling to figure out how we service them as well. Does that go here though? Does that go in the UPSFF formula? Is it a recommendation to change the formula? At one point, that's how it started, Kathy, but I think there was some hesitation. So I would say initially that was the, the thought that there would be in a specific formula um, about it. I, I'm not sure that's the, the right way to go. Um, so I think you're right in asking that question. I think that's a question about whether that maybe go in a different section or not, but. Um, well, or maybe it's something that, you know, needs to be studied. I just, I feel like that's a big, that's a big thing and I would like to have longer to discuss it and how to figure it out, but I don't feel like it with one more meeting, we can put it into an actual recommendation here, especially without, you know, all the parties involved um, being at the table, but I understand what you're saying. Um, so maybe it goes into a study this, but it, I'm not sure what the funding would, how the funding would work. In terms of the UPSFF with what we're with the ELL weights. So I think I can't see how we can put it into this right now. And uh, just maybe it's, just maybe it's like the, the um the other thing. Sorry, Kathy, you suggested that we move into the four further exploration category. You know, I mean, I don't want to parking lot too many things there, but it does seem like the work is like substantial see. work and unveiled unveiled a number of things that maybe aren't exactly UPSF funding related. Um, I mean, they're I mean, everything's funding related, but um, that would live in this um, for future um, exploration category. I agree. With that. I do want to make some more quick clarification. Currently, DCPS is paying for the Welcome Center out of their UPSF. 
That, that That's the only thing that's interesting to me about this is that they're actually paying it out of their UPSFF. So it would get shifted out of the UPSFF and come in under the DM, the Aussie budget or something. I mean, that's what we would be yeah. looking at. So the DCPS, because they do that for all students, even if they end up at a charter school eventually. Sort of. I mean, yes they think. No. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I think obviously they're going to be, you know, if, if a family comes and, and they're talking to them, they're going to get all the information regardless of where they end up. But if they're a DCPS student, then they're going to get all the services that they need um, that are managed by DCPS. So, for example, there's data, right? They go into their data system for ELL. They, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I, yeah, I just think. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I agree that this requires more discussion. I just want to start with that. I, I just wanted to clarify, though, that there is a relationship with UBSFF because DCPS is paying for it out of their UBSFF, and it is a service they're providing to their students. And there's an, a lack of efficiency in UPSFF dollars if every school has to replicate those services. Well, and that is true of a lot of things, actually. But if I were DCPS, I wouldn't want to give that up either. So, so I think that the replication of services is a huge category that we could look at that this falls into. Um, so where are we at? I don't know. Here you and I are chatting. <laughs> uh, so there's... I think what I'm hearing is that there should be something about mod making modifications to the Welcome Center and including that um, in the report. Um, I think we're going to we'll put it into this area of additional exploration. Um, it sounds like everybody wants it to be included, but uh, needs more work. And what about sort of in the in the same light, Ryan, framing this as one of the priorities of this working group is focusing on English language learners, right? And it was brought up as a as Shannon put out put in and what Vanessa was saying. This was a really great cross sector way of supporting these students. It didn't have like to me like a slam dunk in a UPSF weight per se, but it is something that was identified. And maybe there wasn't enough time to delve into it deeper, or if or is or isn't the right group to do this, but. I think it's important and it's worth flagging in the theme of that's what we're, we're focusing on. Does that work, Vanessa? Let's see if I got it. Okay, any last comments on uh, the EL recommendations? Okay, um, so we've reviewed and commented on all of the recommendations that we have written down. We've talked about the foundation level and uh, we will go back in and draft something related to the foundation level. I want to open this up and we have maybe. Hey, Ryan, can I just flag one thing I pawned as I put it in the chat? <laughs> I'm so sorry, but since it's uh, on the sorry. paper before. Can you hear me? No, no, okay, no. Go, um, go. In 1C, uh, we talk about foster students, foster students that are in um, CFSA, that it wasn't uh, well supported, but it's something that we talked about. I again worry about about putting that as in a recommendation section, and not because CF, not because of the uh, students and because of the need that the Acton study showed that they have, but because of the implementation challenges of. The audit then would have an individual category of CFSA students, the privacy concerns, LEAs are not even aware of who is CFSA, and then we'd have to project for it. All of that gives me incredible pause, and it worries me to put in the recommendation section. So again, I'm not suggesting it's not included in the report. I just suggest it not be in the recommendation section. And I'm curious on others thinking on that. Sorry about that. So, Jen, where it says that we would do two fact, if we take that out, but we're still doing two people that have two different qualifications, or are you saying no? So that part, I, I have my own personal feelings about that. I think I was one that didn't, I'm not a huge fan of it, but that is less challenging than pulling out, I'm reading one scene unless I'm reading it wrong, of pulling out foster care individually. Isn't that how it's supposed to be that? It's, it's not very many kids. I well, it's not very many kids, and it causes all sorts of challenges. 
And I probably didn't. I think no, it's just I, think the I, I think the privacy thing is. is right. So I'm not suggesting it come out of at risk, and I'm not suggesting it not be a fact, part of the factors of two plus. When I'm when I'm flagging as a concern of it be a standalone uh, category, which I think this is what this is saying. Okay, that makes sense to me. Sorry to go back with you. I'm going to take silence as a green light. <laughs> Unless uh, anybody uh, disagrees. Yeah, I mean, I I hear the concerns about implementation and privacy. I worry about in this process, in eliminating or shortchanging ourselves because of logistical concerns, right? So if it, it, it could be that part of our recommendation is to figure out a way to do this that doesn't um, bring up those privacy concerns or in a, you know become a logistical nightmare. But if we think substantively it's important, I would want to make sure that we keep it in. Yeah, and I think what Jen is recommending is that it it stays in the report. It's not in the recommendation section, but there's the additional like context um, sections that are included in the report. That and, and I think what I'm saying is that if we think it's a recommendation, I think it should stay a recommendation, even if there are logistical issues. Let the people on the other end figure out how to do the implementation as opposed to devaluing it before it even gets to that point. Right, so to the to the point earlier, there is value in saying that this group recommended X, um, and then let someone figure out how to make that happen. If we if we just make it a part of the context, it's going to get lost. So Shannon, I hear you on that, and I am not interested in get it getting lost. I am concerned about people reading this quickly and just moving forward without solving any of those challenges. So if this was to stay in, I would want to put in some language about what that all means. I, I think that's fine. I mean, I think we could do that for almost any of this, right? Like all of these, these recommendations are going to create some logistical issues here or there. I would want to this make sure- This one's a big we, one though. This yeah. one's a really large one. That's why I'm, I'm flagging this one in particular. I agree, but I would want to make sure that we don't use the kind of language that we did before where it makes it seem like the logistical burdens outweigh the recommendation. Right, so how I'm fine with kind of acknowledging that, and I think it actually is a good thing to acknowledge that we recognize that there are some concerns here, but I wouldn't want to make the concerns, you know, three times bigger than the recommendation. So if there's a way to be kind of creative with the phrasing to say this is a recommendation and we acknowledge these these concerns, um, I, I'm, I would support that. But Ryan, we're not going to list A, B, C, and D when we do it. Like we, some of these things just say these are the things we didn't support. Like I thought all four of those would get rewritten in some way because it says most group members disagree with funding this though, you know, so I, I think we would take out the the things that we disagree with. We wouldn't put that, we would put, this is what we want. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we ended up saying? That for, for the first recommendation, we're recommending overage high school students and two factor identification. Are we also recommending that we want an additional amount of money to go to CFSA? Because I think we should be very clear with that just in number one, not A, B, C, D, but just what we want. Because it's not clear to me, actually. I agree with that. Similarly, like, it seems like we're just, I think we should just be very clear on what we're, what we actually are recommending and not caveating or saying but this 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 um because i found it kind of difficult to follow what we were actually saying we were yeah jen are were you talking about c that's on the screen in front of us yes c. yes yes c. Okay. yeah exactly yeah kathy i i agree with you i hear what you're saying shannon that you don't want things to get lost and i also want this report to be a good representation of the time that this working group has spent hashing over some really hard stuff, right? So I think the body of the report, this is just the recommendation section, the body of the report should have a lot of that. But I agree with you, Kathy, in the end, similar to how the report we had at the last iteration, I think it was pretty, it was like too, you know, pretty clear and concrete. And so I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, and I think, again, as I said at the start, like being able to capture a lot of varying viewpoints, we wanted to try to capture that. And I think some of that can get moved into more of like a con the context section of the report so that 
the recommendations are more streamlined and direct for what act for what the working group is actually recommending. So, so can someone clarify for me, because I may just be confused, what are we recommending for students in foster care? So what is C and how does that fit in with what Jen was saying earlier? I guess I thought we weren't like, I thought we were just like for this whole thing, we were saying students with two plus characteristics, like that is the recommendation, not CFSA, but I don't, maybe I'm misunderstanding. To me, I thought it was um, putting both as I, as, and I'm going on memory here is that those were the more popular options when we were doing the temperature check. Um, so we wanted to make sure that those were the options that were included in the recommendation as the ones that the majority of the working group favored. So are we gonna recommend an increase for just CFSA separate from the two, two factor and the overage? I mean, I think it just comes down to, are we recommending overage and two factor? That's our priority, but we're not make, we're not giving the council the choice. Well, some people wanted this, so we'll just go with this. We're kind of saying, this is what we wanted. And this had a secondary, this is something that we want to look into, a way to fund CFSA more. I, I, I'm also confused. I, I don't sense that there's actually a lot of disagreement among us on what we've kind of settled on. So I'm, I'm curious about why we need to put it in the, the front part and not in the flesh out part of the discussion. Okay, so I, I, we're, we're running out of time and we do need to do the public comment period. So um, I can think we just, that- Can we just, yeah, let's settle this one though. I mean, this is a big one. I agree with Kathy that it's the two and the overage and everything else gets moved to the body. And then I'm curious, I think I just said, I repeated what you said, Kathy, right? Okay, so then I'm curious to hear what other people's thoughts. And Shannon might be, might, I don't know, Shannon, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You might disagree, and we'd like to hear that, you know, hear from everybody else. That would be helpful, because that would give everybody a lot of clarity on what we're going to expect to see in the next draft. Yeah, so I, so th thank you for that. If, if the recommendation is just one, to Kathy's point earlier, and not A, B, C, and D, I think we have to figure out how to frame all the other context. Because reading through, it seems like, it seems like people were okay with this, but they were also okay with that. And so if, if we are going to present it that way, I, I would want to present it that way and not take out the foster care because it's logistically not clear. If it's really that, I mean, not implementable. If it's really that everyone wants A, and a couple of people are okay with B and B is not going, let me not use the letters. If everyone is okay with number one and a couple of people want one C and so one C is not going to be a recommendation of this group, I think it's fine to make it context. But if we do think that any part of one C is going to be a recommendation, I would not want to remove that recommendation because of logistical concerns. Yeah, I agree with that. I just don't know where the group is on it. So maybe it's another survey, like a final survey. We did a temperature check and then it's not mine. But unless you want to do the vote right now, it's up to you. Um, I, I think we should, again, I think we should do a survey and I, I'll work with Kevin on that just to make sure that everyone's voice is heard because there's only a few people that are talking right now and there's some people that are not in attendance that are working group members. So I think a survey is is the right thing to do. Um, is that okay with everybody? And is there any other uh, last, last points on this? Okay, great. Um, so, there were two things that I wanted to do. One is the public comment period. The other was just open it up to make sure that we're not missing anything else. I think we've captured everything that we wanted to include in recommendations, but let me just open that up to the to the floor. Was there anything that someone was expecting to be in here that is not in here right now? or that we haven't already discussed.
Ryan, can you just clarify um, what's going to happen with the foundation funding? So you guys are going to draft up something and then we'll talk about that next time. I just want to make sure that that doesn't get missed in the in our recommendations. Yes, so yep. there will be a foundation level recommendation that we will draft and send it to the group prior to our final meeting. And we will do that based on the discussion that we've had here today. And if anybody wants to provide any additional comment on that, they can email us uh, their thoughts if they didn't share them in the meeting today. Okay, I am going to do the public comment period now. So if anybody from the public wants to provide a public comment, you can use the raise your hand feature and then I can unmute you and you can share your thoughts. And I don't see anybody raising their hand right now. Um, but again, if anybody from the public wants to provide any comment, you can use the raise your hand feature and then I, I will unmute you and you can um, you can share whatever you'd like. Uh, since there's no public comment, uh, that gives us more time if if we wanted to tackle any final issues or anything, or if there's anything anybody wanted to bring up um, before we close out. So the next steps for us is to take all of the feedback that we've heard here. And I think that today's session was really good. We got a lot of a lot of feedback on the recommendations. Um, again, it's still in a draft form and, and uh, we won't finalize things until after the next meeting. So everyone will see a new draft version before our final meeting, which will be held in two weeks, um, Thursday, 3 p.m. on December 17th. Um, if you have anything that you want to share with Kevin, Lindsay, and I, you can email us any thoughts and comments, um, and we will make sure that those get addressed. Hey, Ryan. Yes. Sorry, Jen. Yeah, go ahead. So the foundation recommendation, there mm -hmm. seems to be interest in su submitting a recommendation. I don't know what you guys are going to be able to put down besides that at this point. <laughs> Is there, was there something else that I missed? There's a cost of living increase. I don't, I just, I feel like that seat, we spent a lot of time in the beginning on it, which I understand why, but I don't understand what the draft will say. Mm -hmm. I don't think we got that far. And I realize it is 440. However, we do have a few minutes to Could talk we, about I it. mean, technically we have we have 20 minutes that we can we can talk about it if you guys want to. Yeah, I mean, I think my recommendation would be that we put a number. Um we actually have a number in, in that. And so whether that's we talk about it today or we talk about it through email and, and come back to it in the next meeting, but we need we need to have a conversation about that. I think we should do it right now. We have we have 20 minutes and I don't want to uh, go back and forth on email and then surprise everyone at our last meeting and and have to spend a lot of time um, on it then. Um, so, so what what would it look like? You, you, it, um, three and four percent were suggested. And then would we add on the other the cost of our specific recommendations? How does how is this going to work exactly? Like if it was say for example it was three percent, just throwing that out. What would that look like? You would say, and I don't have the numbers in front of me. It's it's this much money, and then in addition to that, we would ask for what are we asking for for our targeted populations? Because I I don't want to. This is my having been on this for three years. At the end, we always default to just adding the foundation, and I really want this time to be much more targeted. Um, so I understand we we have to protect the foundation and all the students, but I, I want to know what the find what this is going to actually look like. You know what the mayor and the counselor look at it, how much money do they want? So I would like to have some idea what that figure would be. 
if it was 3%. I mean, they do that with percents, right? Like, okay, we want 3%, 4%. And then what would, what would ours be that we want on top of that? For new members, is it possible just to review the way um, the recommendations have been done in the past for the foundation from the working group? Uh, we can do that. Lindsay, do you have the previous report up available? Or uh, I can just pull it up on our website. Yeah, I can get it real fast. Give me just a couple seconds. You know, I, th I think what we didn't spend a lot, we, we didn't spend a lot of time on our justifications. We, we have the data and we have the UPSFF study, but I think we alluded to things like the pandemic and the context and the students that have lost and the state of education that we would definitely need to have in this report to provide our rationale for what we're asking for. Not our discussion, but our actual rationale for the specific recommendations that aren't just driven by um, test scores or achievement gaps, but by by even a larger, a larger issue. Yeah, and I'll I'll read what uh, the recommendation was from the last report. Um, it was recommendation to the UPSFF foundation level increases should be more predictable for LEAs by tying increases to an index measure that takes Washington DC's education costs into account with the goal of closing the gap between the current foundation level and the adequacy studies recommended foundation level. So there wasn't actually a number tied to that, but there, but it was trying to um, tie it to to an index measure. But what would the uh, difference if we were trying to quantify that today, like the difference between where we are and where the adequacy study would have us? How would we quantify that? So I don't we we had done that in for previous working groups. I don't think we did that for for this one because we were spending most of our time on the uh, on the the 2020 UPSFF study. Um, but in the past, we had looked at what the adequacy study recommendation found what the adequacy studies recommended foundation level was in 2013 and then did a inflation inju adjustment to it to see what it would have been in like 2018 or in this case 2020 and compare that to where we are now with the increases that the mayor had done over over the past six or seven years. Yeah, the only the only reason I ask that is I know we were also referencing the adequacy study when we were talking about the targeted investments as well, and it it just seems that um, if if we're going to reference the adequacy study, we should reference it throughout to provide some consistency and uh, impetus for action for the entire uh, set of recommendations. I can say that the fiscal year twenty one UPSFF is about $320 below what was recommended in the adequacy study when you adjust for inflation. Um, so, Thanks. that's the context. Great, thank you. And the percentage increase was 3%. Yes. So, I, so I, I don't think I hearing what, what would be the percentage if we wanted to tie it to inflation plus adequacy study like what would that percentage be that gap between where we currently are and where we would be next year if we were to follow the same calculation from the adequacy study what would that percentage be do we know i do not know that off the top of my head if that's something that we'd have to to work on um after this yeah. thing, unless someone else has it I mean, I can say that for fiscal year 21, DCFPI had recommended a 6% increase to put the district on the path to close in the gap between the adequacy study and the current rate in two years. So that's looking at, you know, what the gap was plus inflation. Um, and we'll likely be doing a similar analysis like in January, February, but we haven't done a new one. In terms of the structure of how we make the recommendation for the foundation increase, I guess I'm most curious about 
the facilities funding increase that was set for about five years where there was a minimum increase every year. Um, I'm just curious how that came about and if that could be like how that wasn't applied to the foundation and if that could be a, the way that we look at the foundation where you know that there's a minimum increase every year for you know some set period of time. I don't know what the background is or what the impetus was for that. Shelly, I think that's something that we'd have to go back and look at. I will um, I will look it up and, and provide the information. Uh, I, I only know that uh, many years ago, the facilities was calculated as a percentage of uh, capital given to the CPS. And it was kind of a formula derived from that. Right now we are at uh, $3,000, $3,400 for non-residential facilities and $9,200 for the residential facilities. But they have increased, uh, not, not as much, but they have. The UPSFF has increased steadily over the years. Do others feel that it's reasonable to um, tie the recommendation to trying to close the gap on, on the adequacy study? I mean, is, that seems to be a commonly understood measure that while aspirational also seems rational. So we will, um, I think what makes sense is we will do that calculation. We also want to follow up with you on the, the survey for the at-risk stuff so we can include that in the email and possibly figure out a way to include that in a survey too um, and get the group input on that. Because it sounds like we all need more information before we can actually uh, tie down what the foundation level recommendation number or, or how it works is. Yeah, I'm wondering how folks feel about sort of also including some of the language that was in the report last year about tying it to like real cost because my concern with only like benchmarking the adequacy study is that like our educational realities are drastically different now and will be moving forward and the adequacy study was done in 2013. So I'm just wondering if there's like an appetite to at least acknowledge that like there's going to still need to be consideration for like the the new ways in which students are learning and that that needs to also be built into or at least considered when we're when the mayor is increasing considering increases to the the base level i think you raise a great point and i think that provides greater context for the adequacy study okay great um i agree with that as well i think that's a Adequate study just feels very dated at this point to me. Great. Okay, so we have some work to do um, offline once we wrap up this meeting and we'll get back to you all. Um, we are on a tight time frame um, between now and the 17th to get you guys an updated version of the recommendations. So if you are going to send us any additional feedback via email, um, I do encourage you to do that earlier. Um, don't wait for the week of the 14th. Um, it's just going to put a lot of work on our plate um, to get you to get you guys a final a final draft um, before the 17th. Um, but with that, I think we can close out. Um, oh, sorry. I there is someone who raised their hand from the public, so I do want to acknowledge them really quickly. Um, Matthew. Fruman, I'm going to unmute you right now. If you can just uh, state your name and and your comment. Uh, thank you very much. And apologies, I had a hard time finding the raise your hand button. Uh, there's an awful lot on the table here, but um, I wanted to talk about something that's sort of in parallel to the discussion here and builds off of Guabilla's comment about how DCPS supplants general education dollars with at-risk dollars. And one of the reasons why that may happen is that DCPS is structurally underfunded relative to the charter sector um, through the way we do the UPSFF now. Um, there's talk about the facilities allocation now, but the way in which 
uh, DCPS pays about a thousand dollars a student in maintenance and operations for buildings and and grounds, and the charter sector pays about on average five hundred dollars per student. So the tax on UPSFF dollars for DCPS over what the charter sector uh, uses for that is about five hundred dollars per student, about twenty five million dollars a year creating an imbalance and the, the same when when the adequacy study looked at this they knew that funding maintenance and operations through the UPSFF didn't really make sense and grappled with it but now we see years out how it's how imbalanced it is and the facilities allocation when you look at how those dollars are used through the audits about 2600 uh, of the 3400 dollars are used for facilities and about 800 are used for maintenance and operations. So as you get up to uh, uh, the, the, it isn't that that the charters are underfunded through the current facilities allocation, they're actually overfunded and use it to pay for things that DCPS has to pay for out of the UPSFF. The same kind of issue comes up around enrollment. Um, DCPS gains about 500 kids a year. The charter sector loses about 1,300 kids a year. And we're not accounting for those shifts in enrollment in the way in which we fund the sectors, and that shortchanges DCPS significantly. Before you make changes to the UPSF foundation level and the UPSFF weights, a first thing you should do is address those discrepancies between the way in which the sectors are treated in the way we fund uh, fund schools through UPSFF dollars. And, and if you do that, you raise the ability to serve exactly the kinds of populations that you're talking about in very significant ways. So I hope you know, you're looking at all these other different things about the different weights, but look at the way in which the UPSFF dollars are allocated in the first place based on enrollment and how they have to be used to fund things like maintenance and operations as well. And you can solve a very important problem and help lots of kids. All right. Thank I'd like you. to say something about thank that you, because um, there is another version uh, of this situation. Charters uh, have used um, the argument that DCPS is overfunded specifically because of the fact that they were getting more money for facilities. So I don't know where the, the situation is located right now, but in the last two or three years, that was the case. Okay, thank you, Alonzo, and, and thank you, Matthew, for, the, for that comment. Um, I think we can close it out now. Um, so our next meeting will be in two weeks. Um, we'll come back to you with uh, an email about further information, and then we'll also get the uh, updated draft recommendations to you prior to that last meeting. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you all. I thought this was a productive meeting, and we will see you all again in two weeks. Thank you.